Morning, it's Pastor Kirk Massey with uh, Shepherd and the Pines Lutheran Church in McNary and Church of the Open Bible in White River. I'm here to share God's word with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're looking at a couple verses, verses 1 through 3 and then verses 9 to 13. 1 Corinthians chapter um, 8, verses 9 to 13. Let's begin with uh, Luther's morning prayer. If you notice prayer, go ahead and join with me. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept us this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. First Corinthians, that's what we're looking at today. Thank you for, for tuning in, for joining this morning for taking a few minutes out of your day to to listen to God's word. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now concerning these things to idols, knows these things sacrifice to idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone supposes that he knows something, he does not yet know the way he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this person has been known by him. And be careful that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, a person who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of this man, weak as he is, be emboldened to eat food from an idol sacrifice? You see, the weak person is being destroyed by your knowledge. The brother for whose sake Christ died. And when you sin in this way against your brothers and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I do not cause my brother to sin. Here ends our reading. This is God's word. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends of Jesus, as we continue on this, uh, this sermon series, this journey through the first letter that uh, the Apostle Paul recorded for us in the Bible, 1 Corinthians, we are um, taking a look at this, this letter. And just remember that this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote is a letter of encouragement. He wrote this letter as an encouragement. And it's also, um, you know, there, there's warnings in there as well and rebukes in there. But he, he warned them out of love. He warned this congregation. Remember, the Apostle Paul started this congregation on his first journey, first missionary journey, or his, sorry, his second missionary journey. Um, his first journey, he went through the, 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 the province of Asia Minor, and it was during a visit there, this, the second visit that he made, he crossed over then into Europe and in, into Macedonia, and his, he made his way down to Greece, and he started this church then in, um, in Corinth. And the, um, so it was a fairly young congregation. And, uh, but, but he rebuked this congregation as we see, you know, the, the number of um, sermons that were preached over the last several weeks. Um, the, the congregation that the Apostle Paul started, um, he rebukes them um, in love, though. And he also encourages them in love. And, you know, they were a young congregation. Um, pretty young congregation and so they were struggling they were struggling with different things they were struggling with some growing pains and we heard over the last few weeks some of them were seeking only earthly wisdom some of them were saying I only listened to the apostle Paul I only listened to Apollos I only listened to Peter I only listened to Jesus and so they were they were kind of forming these different groups within the church and letting that get in the way of the gospel ministry we also um, saw that they were uh, guilty of not disciplining people who were sinning within the church. They were um, hesitant to discipline um, people in, in their congregation. And so we can see that uh, this congregation had many problems they were struggling with. And the, the Apostle Paul writes this letter to them, but he does so. He writes this letter in grace, peace, and wisdom and love for them. This coming week, we are celebrating um, July 4th, we're celebrating our freedom. 
um, that uh, you, we, we, we get do so every year in, in July, this country of ours celebrates its Independence Day, the day that it declared itself free from the rule of England. And, you know, we that happened on July 4th. And um, as Americans, we, we value this freedom that we have, don't we? We cherish it, we um, use it, um, but we also know as, as Christians, um, we abuse this freedom, don't we? The, um, the country, this country of ours allows us to have many freedoms. You know, one of them is the freedom um, of speech, right? We, we can say whatever we want um, and, and know that that's okay. Now we can say whatever we want about leaders, about people, but a way that we abuse that freedom is not thinking it, and we we're not thinking about our words and, and we don't care what we say. We don't care how we say it. We don't care who we say it to. And so I'm gonna say and, and, and you know lie about people all I want. And that's how we abuse that freedom of speech. We also have um, you know, the rights to bear arms and sometimes that right, we uh, people abuse it by by purchasing weapons just to hurt and kill people. We also have this um, freedom of religion. We could worship. We're free to worship what we want. And a way that we abuse it is by creating idols and false gods for ourselves and say, "This is my god, and this is who I'm going to worship and pray to." So we. We, as, as a country, have freedom, but we sometimes abuse that. And as followers of Jesus, we also are free. Through Jesus Christ's perfect life and his innocent death, we have freedom. Freedom from our sin. All our sins have been paid for by Jesus. We have been justified, declared not guilty by God because of Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus. We also, you know, so, so that's how we're free from our sins, but we also... Um, are, are free from the devil. We're free from hell. Um, but sometimes as Christians, yeah, and, and we're also free from the law, you know, the law that, that God has, has given to us. Um, but we know as, as, as Christians, we also can abuse this freedom. We also can take this, this freedom if we're granted and abuse it. So how do we do that? Let's take a look at God's, God's word as we journey through these, these, this writing of the Apostle Paul. Um, and, and we see that in these first things that, that the Apostle Paul points out a, a word he calls idols. He says, now concerning the sacrifice to idols. Um, see, the city of Corinth, and, and we, as we know, the whole country of Greece um, had a long history of idol worship. The Greeks had gods that they worshipped, they worshipped and they prayed to. And they built temples to, and they sacrificed um, meals to, and, and so this, so they have a hot, long history of of, of idol worship, and uh, they prayed to them. And when the apostle Paul came with the gospel, came with the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, and said, "This is God, God's Son, Jesus Christ, and this is what He did for you." Uh, many people came to faith. The Holy Spirit worked through that message of the Apostle Paul about Jesus and, and worked on the hearts of people there in Corinth, this, this, this very important, um, huge, at that time, a, a huge city. And the gospel worked and, and created faith in people. And, and they, now they turned away from those idols that, that are, were, were scattered throughout their, you know, were um, scattered in, in, in you know, temples and, and gods in their city, they turn away from all of that and they turn to Jesus. In faith, they believed in Jesus as the only savior from sin. And so they accepted this good news and they trusted then in God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, the, the triune God. They left that formal way of life that they had of, of following these false gods and worship now only the triune God. Um, and, you know, as, and, and within that congregation in Corinth, uh, you know, some people now were, were mature in their faith. 
they matured in, in their faith and they trusted only um, in, in Jesus and they um, prayed to Jesus and, and they filled their lives with Jesus every day. But there was also some who were newer Christians, you know, so they were still um, working through um, their faith, you know, and, and um, maybe still struggle with some of their, the, the gods, you know, kind of combining them. And so we, we call those weak Christians, those who, um, you know, weren't really solid yet in their faith in, in Jesus. And the congregation were struggling with this, with, with the practice that they were seeing in their church. And so they wrote the Apostle Paul and they asked him this question, is it okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols? You think about that, um, eating meat, you would think that's, that's not a big deal, right? Um, doesn't seem, seem harmful to a person, but it actually was. And, and here's, you know, um, the Apostle Paul answering this question, and, you know, is it okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols? And it, it was causing problems within the church. And so let's take a look at how it was causing problems and was also um, creating a stumbling block for the weak Christians. Um, there, there was, you know, as, as part of a practice in Greece, in Corinth, they would butcher a cow. Uh, maybe it was a pretty big cow. And part of that meat that they butchered would go to sacrifices to one of these idols in the city. Um, you know, say they had a gathering and there was uh, a, a cow that they, they brought to, to use in this sacrifice. So they sacrificed meat to this idol. And then part of that cow, part of that uh, cow that they butchered uh, would also be eaten for this sacrifice. And whatever was left over um, then went to the local butcher, to the local um, shop who sold meat. And so it was divided into three different parts, you know, one for the sacrifice, one for the meal pertaining to that sacrifice. And then um, whatever was left over then was given to the butcher and he sold it then. And say you were a, you know, when, when this meat that was sold at a market was given to a, a Christian um, and, and say you, you know, say you're a mature Christian in, in, in Corinth and you were being a mentor to a newer Christian, someone just come, come to this faith in Jesus. So you invite them over, you invite them over for a meal. Um, and, and, you know, as, as you're, so you're entertaining them and you just tell them maybe that this meat was bought down at the local butcher. Um, and, and this person now realizes that, you know, they, they're, they're smart. You know, they, they knew um, the practices of, of the, the city and, and what meat was you know, being used for. And, and so now they're sitting there eating this meat that you cooked. Um, and and so they, they now they have this burden because they maybe they left that life. Maybe they were at one time associated with that kind of sacrifice, that kind of religion. And they are now sitting there eating meat that was part of this ceremony. And, and it bothered them. Um, and, and they had this guilt now and shame um, sitting in their minds um, because of this, you know, food that they were eating. And they were, um, you know, maybe guilty, felt guilt because of that. And um, so the, the problem, though, was this, what the Apostle Paul points out in verse 9. He says, and be careful that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, a person who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of this man, weak as he is, be emboldened to eat food from an idol sacrifice. Some of the Christians, some of the mature Christians were taking this freedom and abusing it. Um, they, they understood, see, as a, as a mature Christian, they understood that a false god was a false god, that it had um, no power. It was a piece of wood. It was a piece of stone. It had no life in it. Um, and so they understood that and they believed what that idol was, it was lifeless, it meant nothing, um, and it was not real. And the, the meat that was sacrificed there 
was meat already that that ha is God's meat. Okay, so that that's how the mature Christian is thinking in this congregation. They they know it's a false god and has no meaning, um, and the meat is God's. Everything belongs to God, and so they had this way of of thinking. But um, the weak Christians they weren't there yet at that thinking of the mature Christian. They were still working through their faith. They were still working through. Um, you know, this, this newfound faith that they had um, and, and still, you know, still trying to, to get to that level of, of mature Christians. And they were feeling guilty now because of this meal that they were participating in um, and, and having it sit on their conscience then. When you do something wrong, there's something inside of you that, that tells you that was wrong. If you're speeding through town and the speed limit is 35 miles an hour, um, but you're going through 50, there's something in your mind, hopefully there's something in your mind that says, this is wrong, I'm breaking the law here. Um, if you are um, getting high, there's something in your, in your mind, in your heart that is saying, I, I, I shouldn't be doing this. If you are um, you know, thinking of committing adultery, there's something in your heart and mind is saying, this is wrong, I am married and I shouldn't be doing this. Or I, I have to wait and hold, withhold myself um, and wait for marriage in order to, you know, to, to enjoy the blessings of marriage. And so there's something in, in, a, in, a, in a person's, uh, in a Christian's heart and mind that is telling him it's wrong. And that's, that's what we call a conscience. Um, and these new Christians conscience was being bothered when they were eating this meat that possibly was used in a ceremony in, in Greece. And you think about that today and, and put it in today's terms, how, how do we make that same mistake that some of these Christians in Corinth were making. How, were, how do we do that today? Um, how do we take freedom and abuse it? A couple of ways, you know, one of the ways that we could do that is by alcohol, okay? Um, so you, 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 have, you don't have a um, alcohol abuse um, problem. You don't have, um, you know, a problem with alcohol. You can have one can and, and one can of beer and that's it. One glass of, of wine and that's it. One, um, one little, you know, glass of, of whiskey and that's it. And, and you, don't, you don't have that craving. You don't have the desire to have more to alter your, your mind. And so say you are, are, are cooking, um, meat at a gathering and you have one beer there and and it's only one but yet say a, a, a person who has a problem with alcohol who struggled with that and they're trying to turn away from that they see you um, and you're a leader in a church okay say you're a Christian you're a leader in a church you are um, you are active in your congregation and so they see this church member um, having a beer um, but they don't really know that, that it's only one beer. All they see is the beer and you drinking it. And they go now and say, well, this person's in church. This is what, you know, I see them doing this in church and being this and this, and they're drinking. So it must be okay then if, if I go ahead and get drunk then on a regular basis. And so they do that then. They, they go and, and, and get drunk and they see, because they see you, even though they, you know, they don't know that it's only one beer that you're having, and after that you 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 could stop. Um, or another thing that another way that we can abuse our freedom as Christians is by going to the casino. Is it wrong to gamble? Possibly, um, and this is what I mean. Okay, it, it could be wrong if if it causes another person to sin. Is it wrong for you? to to gamble you know as a christian is it wrong to gamble ten dollars well if you could 
put that in your budget, for instance, and that's all you gamble is $10 a month or $20 a month, and, and you, you're not there constantly trying to become rich, you know, you're, you're not there to, um, because you, you can't stop, you're there, there because you say that I enjoy this, it's, it's $5, $10, $20, and that's all, I'm not gambling anymore, I can walk away from this, and this is just a way for me to enjoy, and so, you know, we, we could do that as a Christian, we could do that, but if someone who, who is just coming to be a Christian, and they have a problem with gambling, they, you know, can't stop, um, it's an addiction for them, or they, you know, use their whole paycheck there, um, or whatever money they have, they use it, and, and they can't stop, and they see you gambling there who, who can't control, who has self-control, who who is only there to spend five or ten, whatever is in your budget that you're allowed to spend, and they see you there, um, and you're a church leader, you, you are a lifelong Christian, in their minds now, they're saying, hey, this person is doing it, so it must be okay. I see this person in church, and they're in a church council, they're, they've been a active member they're doing this or doing that and they're living it but they're here so it must be okay then and so this person now is gonna go ahead and and say well if they're doing it i'm gonna go and do it and they continue to to live that life and struggle with it then that's a sin that's what the apostle paul says when you sin in this way against your brothers and wound their weak conscience you sin against jesus you sin against christ and that's what we're doing when we are as as a, a a mature Christian, as a Christian, is we are wounding people's consciences who are weak, you know, who are new to, to Christianity, new to this belief in Jesus. We are hurting their conscience and, and not looking out for their best interests. Remember, Jesus was asked a question, what is the greatest commandment? Do you remember his response? He says, Love God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. When we take our Christian freedom and abuse it, we are hurting the consciences of our weak brothers or sisters in Christ. And, and instead of leading them to Jesus, when, when we are hurting their conscience, we are actually pushing them away from Jesus. We are pushing them away from their Savior. We're not showing any concern for their faith. We are not showing any love toward their faith. We're not loving our neighbor. And more importantly, we're not loving God with all of our hearts. When we are wounding a conscience, we are sinning, as Paul said, against a Christian. We are sinning against Jesus. We're taking what Jesus did for them, that payment of their sins, and, you know, pushing them away from that pushing them away from that. And eventually, as Paul says, we could actually become a stumbling block, blocking a person's path to Jesus. And friends, that, that's that's a, um, a, a very scary position to be in as a Christian and, and abusing this freedom that we have. That's a very scary thing to do um, is lead another person away from their savior. And if you're if you're guilty, friends, of doing this, if you are, are if you've abused your freedom, your Christian freedom, and and I think all of us at one time in our lives has done that, hurt another person's, you know, a, a weak brother or sisters in Christ, um, their conscience by our actions. If, if we've done that, what do we do? Do you get mad at Jesus and say, man, Jesus, these are all these rules you want to give us. And why do I have to, to put my life on hold? Why do I have to do to watch what I'm doing and so that I don't hurt another person? Do we get mad at Jesus and, and say, man, you're just taking the fun out of life? Or do we do the opposite as well? Turn, you know, put all this guilt and shame on ourselves and, and let it grow and grow inside of us instead of dealing with it. Do we run away from our Savior? No. You know, we, we in, in fact, we, we do the opposite of that. We, we run toward our Savior, just like the Apostle Paul says. We take comfort in knowing 
who God is and what he did for us. We take comfort in God's word. And Paul points out the sin of, of wounding a weak conscience, of hurting the, the, the belief and faith of our brother, sister in Christ. Um, that's the sin, but it's not the ultimate sin. It's not the ultimate sin. And, and Jesus' perfect life and, and innocent death has paid for this sin. All of our sins, even this, this one here that Paul is pointing out, that's what Jesus did for us. And that's what we take comfort in, in God's word. Because God's word tells us what Jesus did for us, of, of God sending him here to be the savior of the uh, sins of all people, being a savior from people's sins. And Jesus did that. Jesus willingly carried out this, this will of God perfectly by giving himself over to the devil and becoming that atoning sacrifice for all of our sins by removing our guilt and shame by paying for this sin and forgiving us of it, forgiving us of all sins because of what Jesus did for us by spilling his blood on the cross for us, friends. The sins of, of, of those, those weak times that we have in our lives, the sins that we are, are tiptoeing around with and playing with, Jesus took care of that. And friends, he did this because he loves you. Because he loves you. He knew that he knows that we cannot find this peace with God by our own. He knows that we can't get to heaven on our own. It's only through Jesus. And he know he knew that. And he did did carry out this will perfectly because of his love for us. And this freedom that we have now, friends, came at a price that came. At, at a, you know, it came at the, the expense of a perfect life and an innocent death. And Jesus made himself into nothing. He lowered himself. And friends, he set us free from our sins. He set us free from the devil and all of his works. And he gave us his word so we could hear of, of how wonderful he is, friends, of this wonderful love that he has for us, for sinners so we could repent, repent when we do fail, when we do hurt the conscience of a weak brother or sister, when we do sin. We, we get to repent. And that's that motivation, friends, that we have from the gospel. The gospel is what motivates us now to live a life pleasing our Savior. We live our lives knowing the price that Jesus paid for us. And in thankfulness, friends, we, with a thankful heart, we know that we are examples. Just like the Apostle Paul pointed out. The Apostle Paul tells the Christians in Corinth, be careful. Be careful with this freedom that you have. You know, think twice um, about this meat sacrifice to idols. And why did he do that? And why, why should we be careful? It's because of the love of Jesus. And, and it, watching our words and our actions takes a lot of humility, doesn't it? And that's what the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Corinthians. Be humble. Lower yourself. Lift up others. That's what he says. Build, love builds up. So build up one another. Don't tear each other down build up another person's, you know, their, their, their faith, uh, build up another person's lives um, in Jesus. But humble yourselves and, and think about your words and actions more seriously. That's what Paul says in verse 13. So therefore, if food causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again so that I do not cause my brother to to sin. What if the Apostle Paul loved me? <laughs> what if he enjoyed a, a pretty good steak once or twice a week? What if he enjoyed having um, sandwiches or um, spam and eggs or something? You know, what if he enjoyed it? I mean, we, we all enjoy a good meal. But imagine if, if 
that meal was causing another person to sin, we would stop. That's what the Apostle Paul is encouraging here. He said, if, if I'm, if another person is being, you know, weakened in their conscience, if they're weakened in their faith because of my actions, I'm going to stop eating meat. And, and that's the, the, the encouragement he's given us, friends, is if, if a person's conscience is weak by them seeing me drinking one beer, then I'm never going to drink a beer again. If a person's conscience is bothered, if they by by them seeing me gamble, then I'm never going to step foot in a casino again. I'm never going to buy a a lottery ticket again, a, a scratch scratch off ticket again. I'm never going to buy that again. Friends, it's some pretty high expectations, right? It may seem impossible, but we know that it's not impossible. That, that's being free. Yeah, we, we, we make the mistake of abusing this freedom. But that's what Jesus tells us to, to deny ourselves by staying away from alcohol, by staying away from the casino, by staying away from meat, if that's leading a person away from Jesus, then I'm gonna stop. And I'm gonna stop and, and care more for them. Jesus says to deny ourselves and, and to pick up our crosses and follow him. And as a, that's our role as a Christian, is to follow our Savior, to pattern our lives after, after our Savior. And Jesus paid the ultimate price for us by giving his life on the cross for us. But he also set us free, free from our sins, free from the devil, free from eternity in hell. And, and, and Paul's encouragement is don't abuse that freedom. Instead, humble yourselves and turn away from sin. But also be an example to people. Give up those different vices for the, for the good of the church, for the good of showing people Jesus. And friends, we can only do that through, through Jesus faith in Jesus Christ. May God give you the strength to do that. And, he, and he, he does. He gives you help in his word. So when you continue to use his word to guide your lives and build your faith up, but also build up one another in love. May you continue to do so, friends. May you continue to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us go ahead and, and close with prayer, and then we'll go ahead and say the, the Lord's Prayer after this. Lord, Heavenly Father, we we um, often we, we know that we fail. You have a, a standard for us, and that is to be perfect, but we know um, that, that we often don't reach that um, and instead we abuse it um, this freedom that we have as followers of yours we we know that it's um, it, it sometimes could get in the way of our Christian lives and so we ask that you um, give us that strength give us the humility um, to to not you know hurt you know weak brothers and sisters conscience to not lead them away from you instead to lead them toward you and, and we ask that you give us that strength to, to live according to you, according to, to your life. Um, and we can only do so by, by completely trusting in you. And so we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to guide us, to give us wisdom, humility, and knowledge, um, to be an example for others. Uh, but also to know that when we fail, to turn to you in repentance, to turn to you knowing that 
that that sin has been paid for because of you. So help us to completely trust in you, Lord. Thank you again for this responsibility, this privilege, um, but also help us to not abuse it. Uh, continue to strengthen us and be with us, Lord, as we are examples um, in this, this, this dark world. And help us to be that light, Lord. Thank you again for this um, privilege. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask that you uh, continue to, to watch over us and, and be with us and guide us. In your name we pray. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom and a power and a glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Have a happy 4th of July. Have a safe 4th of July. And uh, July 4th falls on a Sunday. So go ahead and uh, celebrate your freedom in Jesus by attending church. And then you can celebrate your lives as Americans. God be with you this week.